the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. All right, we're in Revelation 20, 1 through 10. So let me just start off in Acts 1, just before he ascended. Jesus was asked by his disciples in verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And the kingdom about which they were asking, the kingdom for which men have longed for through the ages, the kingdom in which Jesus Christ will be universally acknowledged as the King of kings and Lord of lords, is that kingdom which is discussed in Revelation 20. It is the millennial 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth. When I use the word millennial, that is what is taking into account the 1,000-year reign is what millennial means. And so it's found, of course, in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. That'll be the focus for our study tonight. Let me give just a brief context. Basically, the tribulation, which is uh, Revelation you know, 3 uh, through ver uh, chapter 18, the tribulation with its seal, its trumpets, and bold judgments has ended. Israel has experienced a great revival. The Gentiles throughout the world have come to Christ. Uh, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet have been revealed, defeated, and cast into the lake of fire. Uh, we've seen Babylon, the evil, organized, religious, political, social, and economic system that stands in opposition to God, has been destroyed. And so we see that very closely in the last few chapters. Armageddon has taken place. And number seven, Jesus has come again to the earth to rule and reign as its rightful master, Lord, and King. That was our study last week. And so what we will do right now is dive into the text. And then after we dive into the text, we're going to look at the various views of the millennium again. So let's read the passage. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them, who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus, and because of the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that is our passage for tonight. So quite a bit for us to uh, talk about here as we dive in. We're going to go over this grand recap now of, of everything that we have um, with the, uh, the three different views of the tribulation. And so um, you might remember these. If not, let's take that recap right now. And so going into the commentary on the passage, uh, let's dive into the three views. The doctrine of the millennium mentioned only here in Revelation 20. Uh, it is referred to throughout the Old Testament, but it's mentioned in detail right here. It has generated significant controversy throughout the history of the church. Basically, three major views have been held by various students of Scripture. The, the view that we've been looking at throughout our study has been premillennialism. And so what is premillennialism? That's a big word. And so let's dive into that word. The word millennium, again, comes from the Latin words mille or thousand and Aeneas or annual year, the, the word pre before the word millennialism refers to the time of Christ's second coming as it relates to the millennium. And thus the term premillennialism refers to the millennium, the 1000 year period being preceded by Christ's return to the earth. So very simply, Jesus returns and then the millennium. 
the thousand year reign. Premillennialism holds to the following points. Number one, Christ will return at the end of this age, at the end of the great tribulation, with his saints to the earth to reign for a thousand years as king. Uh, the second point here in the millennium, the nation Israel will experience blessings, the blessings that God promised to Abraham and David pertaining to Israel's land, nationality, and king. So all of those blessings that were given to David and Abraham will find their fulfillment in the millennium. Uh, number three, the New Testament believers will likewise share in some measure in the covenant blessing, having been engrafted into the one people of God. And so we are the sons of Abraham, Father Abraham, we sing. Uh, number four, the church today is not completely fulfilling these promises made to Israel as a nation. Certain aspects of these covenants have been inaugurated, but others await future eschatological fulfillment. The word eschatological just means end times. It's a, another big way to say end times. Uh, number five, the millennial kingdom is the 1,000 year period in which Jesus Christ rules over the earth as the promised Messiah, the seed of David. This kingdom will be inaugurated at his second coming and therefore at the end of the tribulation. This is an intermediate kingdom of a thousand years before we step into the eternal state of, of heaven, where we have the, the new uh, city there and you know the new heavens and new earth. All of that happens at the end. So who's held to this view? In the early church, this view, it's believed, was held by Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius, Barnabas, Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian. These are the church father, fathers, many of them. Cyprian. Uh, good luck saying some of these names. Um, you have Tyndale in, in the, once we get close to the Reformation, you have the Anabaptists, the Moravians, the Mennonites, Latimer, the Huguenots, John Wesley, Increase Mather, Cotton Mather, and many 19th and 20th century, ex, uh, century exegetes. Exegetes are people that study the Bible and, and interpret it and preach it. So you have Charles Ryrie, John Walvrood, uh, Billy Graham, W.A. Criswell, Paige Patterson, John MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll, Danny Aiken, Al Mohler, Herschel York, who was my preaching professor at Southern. These are, this is what I would say in Baptist life has been the majority view throughout Baptist history. And this is kind of what it looks like uh, thought out or, or painted out here. You have the Old Testament prophetic era, number one there. You have the mystery era, the church age. You have the last days in decline that, that declines into the great tribulation. But before the tribulation, your dispensational premillennialist believes Christ will return and rapture uh, and there will be a resurrection of the saints. And then number four, if you see it right here, Christ returns to set up a thousand year kingdom. That is the millennium right there. So his return is before the millennium. And you have the kingdom era where Satan is bound. He's loosed uh, at the end of the millennium. There's a great falling away uh, that we'll study. And you have a resurrection and judgment of the wicked where God intervenes uh, for the apostasy there. Um, and then you have the eternal state. And that is the view that most Baptists have held to. Here's another chart looking at it. Um, and just another explanation of it. Jesus will return to earth before the millennium. The kingdom is yet to come, but before the kingdom comes, Christians will leave the world behind. That's the left behind books. So just reading the paragraph here, before Jesus returns to establish his millennial kingdom, seven years of tribulation will afflict the earth. Most dispensational premillennialists expect Christians to be raptured from the world before the tribulation. A few dispensationalists do, however, expect God to remove Christians from earth partway through the tribulation, uh, like a mid-trib rapture. Dispensationalists see Israel and the church as two separate groups for whom God has two separate plans. During the Great Tribulation, God will renew his work with the earthly nation of Israel. And so this has been the view we've studied. And, and as we've walked through Revelation, we've followed the pre-millennial view. But you need to know the amillennial view, sometimes called the realized uh, view of millennialism, where we realize we're at it right now. So the prefix A means no, and thus amillennialism holds that there will be no literal reign of Christ on earth for 1,000 years. It's, it's very figurative. And so the basic tenets of amillennialism are as follows. Number one, the millennium or the kingdom reign of Christ and his saints is in existence for the period of time between Christ, Christ's first and second coming. So we are in the millennium right now in this view. Um, number two, the kingdom is either the church on earth. That's Augustine's view, now perpetuated by the Roman Catholic Church. 
and or the saints in heaven, which is B.B. Warfield's view of, of the amillennial view, and also a, a Presbyterian view of it. Um, Thus, there will be no future reign of Christ on the earth, and the word thousand is a symbolic number indicating just a long period of time. And so we're in the millennium if you're a millennial. Uh, point three, the promises to Israel about a land, seed, and throne are thus completely fulfilled now in a spiritual sense in the church. Every promise given to David and Abraham is already fulfilled in the church in a spiritual sense. Uh, point four, God's promises to Israel were conditional and have been transferred to the church because Israel did not meet the condition of obedience. They failed in that condition. And so the blessing of God, when Christ cursed the fig tree, now the blessings have been falling on the Gentiles, uh, according to their view. Number five, Christ is ruling now in heaven where he is seated on the throne of David. And Satan is presently bound between Christ's two advents. This binding relates primarily to Satan's inability to stop the preaching and spread of the gospel to the nations. And so they interpret that verse, you know, where Satan is a roaring lion. Yeah, he is a roaring lion, but not within the church, really. He's bound within the church. And so Jesus said, um, wherever the gates, um, wherever the church would go, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Remember, Jesus told Peter that when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter said, you know, upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Satan is bound within the church. He's unable to stop the growth of the church. But outside of the church, he's a roaring lion, and non-Christians have much to fear. That's the amillennial view. And so there are a few verses. Uh, let me read them. Matthew 12, 29. Let me illustrate this. You can't enter a strong man's house and rob him without first tying him up. Only then can his house be robbed. And so it's believed that when Christ appeared, he he bound uh, Satan, where now the church has freedom to move. Uh, while there is warfare, we still have victory as we endeavor to move. Colossians 2.15, in this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. And so the Bible speaks of this victory over darkness and over the devil through the cross. The amillennialist sees a lot of weight in those verses and says, well, that victory holds wherever the kingdom of Christ in the church stands on the earth. You have Luke 10, 17 through 19. This is be the last amillennial verse I'll share. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan falling from heaven as a flash of lightning. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. And so the amillennial view has a very positive view about the growth of the church and, and its ability to step beyond whatever the devil may be scheming. Um, so that's fascinating uh, to look at. Amillennialism has been held by uh, Origen, Augustine, the Roman Catholic Church, John Wycliffe, Martin Luther. Um, again, some names that are hard here, Calvin Zwingli, several of the modern era, including B.B. Warfield, Louis Burkhoff, uh, Hendrickson, R.C. Sproul is probably the most famous in our day that holds to this view. Um, here's a visual ref reference of it. Number one, you have the Old Testament prophetic era. Two, Satan is bound at the appearing of Jesus when he shows up. And, and number three there, you have the New Testament kingdom. The church is set up. Satan will be loosed. Some amillennials believe at the end of the church age, towards the end of it, there will be a last day's decline in the great tribulation. But Christ will return and we will have the resurrection and the judgment of all men and the eternal state. But amillennial, again, means no literal thousand years. And, and so you see that it's just not literal here. Uh, this is an easier chart. There is no 1,000 year millennium as amillennialism. Uh, the thousand years is not a uh, future earthly reign for the amillennialists. The millennium symbolizes the present and ongoing reign of Jesus with his people. It is a spiritual reign that extends from the ascension of Jesus to his glorious return. A millennialist tend to take a unified perspective on the relationship between Israel and the church. And so we're, we're just the people of God with the, the Israelites who are believers in historical Israel before Christ. We're, we're, they were the people of God. The church today is the people of God. Even the premillennial view agrees with that. But amillennialism is a growing view in Baptist life. A lot of, uh, a lot of professors in the seminaries are leaning into the amillennial view and teaching on it, um, and it's, it's a growing 
view in, in our church. We've had a lot of folks uh, through this study come to me and say, I'm actually a millennial. And so you can kind of see on the, the chart here, um, you know, what that looks like. The, the last one that's kind of fading, but it, it flares up here and there throughout church history is post-millennialism. And the prefix uh, post means after, and thus post-millennialism means that Christ's second coming will occur after the millennium. This is the most positive view of history that says that the church age will grow and grow and grow until it makes such an influence on the world that when Jesus returns, he will just be stepping onto a very gently um, ruled uh, earth through the church already. And so it's a very positive view where the, the church age unfolds positively, takes dominion over the world, and then Christ steps onto the earth and the millennium happens. So um, the second coming occurs, though, after the, the thousand years, the millennium, I'm sorry, the millennium happens in the church age before Jesus steps back on the earth. The tenets of this view are these. Number one, the church is not the kingdom, but it will bring in the kingdom, a utopian Christianized condition to the earth by preaching the gospel. Liberals of this position believe the millennium will come through human efforts and natural processes like evolutionary progress. It's kind of a mess. A lot of your liberals do lean into post-millennialism. Uh, number two, Christ will not be on the earth during the kingdom. He will rule in the hearts of people, but he will return to the earth after the millennium. Uh, number three, the millennium will not last necessarily for a literal thousand years. So like a millennialism, it sees the thousand years as figurative. Number four, the church, not Israel, will receive the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham and David in a very spiritual sense. So postmillennialism was first taught by Daniel Whitby in the 18 or sorry the 1600s and 1700s, but it's been held by Jonathan Edwards and Charles Wesley and Charles Hodge, A. A. Hodge, Augustus Strong, James Snowden, Lorraine Botner, B. H. Carroll, and, and George W. Truett, even Pat Robertson today, and some individuals associated with the Christian Coalition from the last 20 years have been sympathetic to some aspects of this position. And so they've tried to take that view and influence politics positively, believing if Christians will just get active politically, we can overtake that and, and create a Christian utopia. And so it's a very um, interesting view. You have on this chart here, you have the Old Testament era, Jesus shows up, uh, so you have the church kingdom era, and you see that line moving up and it's coming up and down. It's getting better and better and better is what that line means. Um, the Great Tribulation happened a bit early. Satan has been bound, and Satan will be loosed at the end. You have gospel prosperity propelling the church. And so, again, some of your charismatic folks are really into this one. You have a brief rebellion. Christ returns, and resurrection judgment of all men happens. Here's another chart. And so let me read this again. Um, this means Jesus will return to earth after a millennium when the overwhelming majority of persons throughout the world embrace the gospel. This millennium may last exactly 1,000 years, or 1,000 years may symbolize an extended area of gospel peace. In either case, Jesus will not be physically present on the earth during the millennium. He reigns spiritually through the spread of his gospel around the globe. Post-millennialists see a unified relationship between Israel and the church. If I could summarize all of them, and let me just give you this chart here. This is the historic premillennial view. Um, and I have the, the modern pre-millennial view on the bottom. You have amillennial in the middle, post-millennial is third down. You can kind of study this for a bit. Basically, your pre-millennial view that we hold to holds to a very bleak future. The, the earth is going to get worse. It's going to get bad. It, the tribulation is going to come and all the stuff we've studied is going to happen. And so you know, we, we've got to be preaching and sharing Jesus as we can now, and we've got to kind of maybe prepare or warn others of the coming future. And, and it's a, again, it's a negative view of the future, but it is what we believe the scriptures teach in the premillennial view. The amillennial view is a little bit more um, hopeful. We're in the millennium now, so Christ is reigning, and wherever the church endeavors to go, there is incredible freedom uh, for the church. If we will, in boldness, take the gospel Satan cannot stand against us. I, I actually hold to that regardless of views here. I think, I do think wherever the church has been bold to endeavor to take the gospel, the, the Lord works in hearts and, and people get saved and Satan cannot stop the work of God. I, I hold to that. I think we all hold to that. Postmillennial view is the most positive view of the future. Uh, it's where everything's going to be getting better. The news may be bad today, 
But in 500 years, it's going to be so much better because it's going to, there's going to be so much Christianity in the world and so many people being believers. It's just a very positive view of the unfolding of things. And so it, it affects a bit how you see the world and how you react a bit. But let me give you a little bit of argumentation here. Why would you want to be a premillennialist, which is what we've been believing? So no, I'm preaching. It's what I've been teaching. Uh, I, I'm preaching to the choir tonight on this. But but I do want to build, a, again, another case for why hold to premillennialism. Why do this? Why should you believe that when Jesus comes again to this earth, he will establish a worldwide kingdom with Jerusalem as his capital from which he will reign as universal Lord and King for 1,000 years? I'm going to give you a number of reasons tonight why we lean into this. Number one is this. It is the view that best honors the normal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the text. As we study and just look at what Revelation says, it seems to be the most normal understanding of how the book unfolds. Chapter 20 clearly follows chapter 19. The word millennium, meaning thousand, occurs six times in verses one through seven. Never in scripture, when the word year is used with a number, is its meaning not literal. Uh, the two resurrections mentioned in verses four through seven clearly speak of physical bodily resurrections. And so you may want to chew on that one a bit. All of these things support a premillennial view. The normal approach to scripture means that the promises about Christ returning to establish on earth his millennial reign of 1,000 years are to be taken in the normal sense. His kingdom is in existence now, and we see that in scripture. It is in heaven and it is in the hearts of men, but will be present on the earth during the millennium. Thus, his kingdom is both right now and it is also not yet. His kingdom is here. It's in the church. It's in you and me if we're in Christ. But the fulfillment of the millennial promises are not yet. And so we're looking forward to the fulfillment. And watching the news today, seeing the shootings in California, I'm, I'm looking at that going, Jesus, come quickly. I'm, I'm ready for you to return. But we're not yet there. Um, number two, a, a reason to be premillennial. The promises to Israel have not been um, transferred to the church. The, the complete fulfillment of the Abrahamic, D Davidic, and New Covenant have not taken place yet, not in a literal sense as we read them. The church and Israel, though distinct, are related to each other in God's plan of redemption personally, nationally, and cosmically. And since the church began on the day of Pentecost, the church is in some sense separate from the nation Israel. Normal grammatical interpretation thus makes a warranted distinction between Israel and the church. And we see when you read Romans 9, 10, 11, God's not done with Israel. And the way that the, those passages read in Romans 9, 10, it, it seems to me to say, well, this is something completely different than just the church. This is totally focused on what God's going to be doing with Israel. Similar with Revelation. It's very different. Number four, in the Psalms and Prophets, a future eschatological in times kingdom patterned after but surpassing the model of the Davidic kingship is predicted. This kingdom is a universal kingdom of peace and prosperity with the anointed Messiah ruling over the whole earth. We have people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, all the Gentiles are involved. For further study, if you want to get the notes later and look these verses up, they will bless you as you see this global worldwide kingdom coming uh, all throughout the Old Testament. Number five, the new covenant in particular, states a number of things. Number or A, we'll do letter A. God will cause Israel to repent and be obedient. Uh, B, God will cleanse and forgive Israel. C, the Holy Spirit will permanently indwell all of his people. D, Israel will be, will be permanently established forever in their land as a nation. E, God will be worshipped by Israel and will fix his presence among them forever. And so that has not fully happened, but the millennium, and then as we've read Revelation, we see God's spirit breaking afresh on Israelites and, and Jewish people where they are becoming saved. Let's look at the words of Jesus, another reason to be premillennial. His promise to the 12 apostles here in Matthew 19. Then Peter said to him, we're giving, we're giving up everything to follow you. What will we get out of it? And Jesus replied, I assure you that when I, the Son of Man, sit upon my glorious throne in the kingdom, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That shows up in our very passage tonight. And it seems to be a very literal statement of Jesus to Peter, not a figurative statement here. 
look at the words to the apostles in Acts 1, 6, and 7. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, are you going to free Israel now and restore our kingdom? The Father sets those dates, he replied, and they are not for you to know. So he's giving a distinction, at least there, between the church and Israel. Uh, the seventh reason and final reason, I believe, Paul's teaching concerning future Israel. Again, I was quoting Romans 9, 10, 11. Look at Romans 11, 25 through 29. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud and start bragging. Some of the Jews have hard hearts, but this will last only until the complete number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all of Israel will be saved. He's speaking of beyond uh, the Gentile age, there will be a time when Israel will have the door swing wide open to them. And we, we must be careful, not every Jewish person will be saved, but the majority will. And I know the text here says all of it, uh, but it, it may be in that day, every Israelite may be saved. It, it, that looks hopeful and awesome. Do you remember what the prophet said about this? And this is Paul just reading from Romans 11. A deliverer will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel from all ungodliness. And then I will keep my covenant with them and take away their sins. Many of the Jews are now enemies of the good news. But this has been to your benefit, for God has given his gifts to you Gentiles. Yet the Jews are still his chosen people because of his promise, his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. I don't know how you can read those verses and see and not see a distinction between the church and, and future Israel. They just seem to me very much uh, separate as far as the gifts and the timings of God's uh, work among them. So the conclusion here, this is a very powerful argument, therefore, for the premillennial understanding of Revelation chapter 20. And so now let us examine the text and note particular features of Christ's kingdom on the earth. That's kind of an intro, really, to what we're diving into now. But since we have 10 verses, everything from now should go pretty quickly. Let's look back in the text. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And so John sees an angel come down from heaven, implying he's now on the earth. The phrase I saw occurs repeatedly in the book of Revelation, indicating a chronological sequence and a progression. These things happen one after the other in the book of Revelation. So we have a timeline here. We have the second coming. We have the millennium. Then we will have the great white throne, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. All of that is to follow. We'll study all of that soon. The first stage of the millennium as God begins to restore creation to its intended order is Satan's removal. So the first stop is we got to get Satan out of here. And that's what happens. Look at verse two. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Looking forward to that day. So the key authority to the bottomless pit, the abyss is mentioned seven times in Revelation, a prison for demons and a great chain symbol for binding and, and confinement here. Um, we have the key to the abyss there mentioned, the great chain in his hand. Uh, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, this angelic policeman who once probably served under and no doubt adored Lucifer, now arrests and secures his former master. And so he seizes the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. You have four names being mentioned here that teach us about his character. These titles um, appeared previously in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, where you just see very similar, the same passage. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil, Satan. Let's dive into the names. He sees the dragon. The dragon shows up 12 times in Revelation. Its emphasis is on its ferocity, its cruelty, and terrifying danger. Ancient serpent is, to me, one of my favorite connections to um, what you have in Genesis chapter 3, um, where Jesus crushes the head, you know, of the serpent there. That looks back to Genesis 3 and the Garden of Eden. He is our ancient enemy, and so he showed up there in the garden. He's also called the devil and Satan. The Greek word for devil is di diabolos. Um, and so that uh, I, I, there are some video games that people play called Diablo, which is the Greek word for and Spanish word for Satan, the devil. Uh, it just means he's a slanderer, accuser, malignant liar, and the father of lies, as he's called in John 8, 44. He's also called Satan here. 53 times in the Bible, he's called Satan, meaning our adversary, our opponent. He is against us. And so... I'm looking forward to verse three. He threw him into the abyss. He closed it. 
put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. So 1 Peter 5 8 teaches that today Satan walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is a major difficulty with the amillennial position, which believes that Satan is bound today. I just don't see where you can have him being bound and still walking around like a roaring lion. Which one is it? And to answer that again, the amillennialist will say he's bound within the church and wherever the church endeavors to go, he's not bound outside of the church. And that's how they answer that uh, that, that question. Satan is not bound now, but he will be bound then. And Satan will be bound for a thousand years. He'll be cast into the abyss. He'll be shut up into the abyss. He has a seal set on him. His activity is completely curtailed and brought to a screeching halt for the entire millennium. Only after the millennium's completion is he released, and then only for a very short period. And this will be looked at in verses 7 through 10. So let's go on to verse four. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. During the kingdom, the saints will reign, as we see in verse 4. John provides only a brief outline description of the millennium in these verses. Additional insight, as we will note, is found in texts like Isaiah 11, 1 through 11, also Isaiah 65, Jeremiah, Joel, Amos, and Micah. Uh, these are really wonderful complementary verses to the millennium. And so you may want to come back to this slide later in the notes and really look those verses up. I have a few of them in the section about Old Testament connections. In verse four again, then I saw thrones, people seated on them who were given authority to judge. We are going to receive a position in the millennium, thrones to sit on as joint heirs with Jesus. And we're told that in Romans 8, 17. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him, we're told we will reign with him throughout scripture. These who sit on the thrones with Jesus are given authority to judge. And so we will receive some level of authority. We read where judgment is committed to them. And, and that, that's a question mark because what judgment? What, what will there be? What will there be to judge in the millennium? Some of the possibilities that have been presented are maybe the apostles will have some judgment over Israel. I don't hold to that, but some think believers will have judgment over the angels. And you have a few verses that kind of look like that. Believers over the nations, perhaps glorified saints over natural born persons in the millennium. We'll get into that whole view here in a minute. But um, we're not exactly sure. Maybe we'll just have areas of uh, authority and areas of dominion that we will be subjugating into the Lordship of Christ during the millennium. And then we will be reclaiming and rebuilding things. Um, I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. And so you need to know first, he's saying, I also saw the martyrs. The saints are the ones that are ruling and reigning with Christ. But now he's going to speak about the martyrs, um, two distinctive groups, but all of us saints. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. So I also saw introduces a new and specific group, the tribulation martyrs. They were beheaded, which is symbolic for executed for their witness to Jesus. Um, so they were, they were killed for following Jesus. They were beheaded for faithfulness to God's word. We also have a few more things here. We're told that they had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And so they wouldn't worship the beast. That's the Antichrist. They wouldn't worship the beast's image. And they wouldn't receive the mark of the beast. So it's very good to see uh, that, that uh, ending of that uh, thought that we've studied earlier on the mark of the beast. They came to life. These, these martyrs came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So they came to life, and they reigned, and it was really worth it for them to live as they did and die for Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, which we'll look at here in a second, unbelievers, lost persons without Christ, are not resurrected literally and physically for a thousand years until the, the millennium is complete. That's exactly what the verse tells us. Look at verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until... A thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Now, you need to know where it says this is the first resurrection. 
it's really referring to verse four. It's referring to the martyrs being resurrected. They're the ones coming to life. That's the first resurrection. So believers will enjoy the first resurrection unto glorified life eternal. We will be resurrected if we're dead in the millennium. We will uh, enjoy the millennium, and then we will uh, go from the millennium into uh, life eternal, into the new heavens, new earth, all of that. Unbelievers, though, will experience the second death, which shows up in Revelation 21, verse 8, rendered at the great white throne judgment. So again, the first resurrection is, is only speaking of believers, only speaking of believers. And we know that because of verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Uh, that's how we know we're interpreting the scripture here. That's how we know that the first resurrection of verse five is speaking of believers, because if you're an unbeliever, it's not a blessed and holy thing. If you if you're brought up, you're just going to be facing judgment. So blessed means made happy and holy set apart by the participation in the first resurrection. And so look at verse six. The second death has no power over them. The second death, the second death has no power over believers. Once you have become a believer in Christ, there's no, there's now therefore no condemnation for you. Christ extinguished the full penalty of death. When he died on the cross, he absorbed the penalty of, of physical death and spiritual death for you and on your behalf and on my behalf. And so because of that, we will, yes, die physically, but when we are resurrected in the first resurrection, there will be no more death for us. But for those who are non-Christians, they will be resurrected and they will face a second death where they will be cast into the lake of fire. Again, Revelation 21, verse 8. So the second death has no power over believers, no power over Christians. But we will be priests of God and of Christ, and we will reign with them for a thousand years. Now, I believe verse 6, though, is referring specifically to uh, the martyrs, the uh, tribulation martyrs. But it also refers to the church, the, the believers, all believers. So the second death, that's eternal death, spiritual death, hell, and separation from God has zero power over us. Because Christ paid in full what was, what was needed from us. He was our substitute and, and offered to God what was acceptable on our behalf. And so we will be able to serve God and Christ as a priest throughout uh, all, of, all of eternity. And we will reign with him a thousand years. So summarizing the millennium, uh, millennium. This is a bit. Uh, this is quite a bit to swallow in, in just a few verses. John sees the saints sharing the millennial reign of Christ in verse four. He sees the saints of other ages reigning with Christ. He sees the tribulation martyrs come to life and reign with Christ. John described the resurrection of the saints in verses five and six. It precedes the resurrection of judgment by a thousand years, and so the the judgment, the white throne judgment, will happen after the millennium. It's called the first resurrection. It is a great blessing to be one of its participants uh, because they will triumph over the second death and they are priests of God in Christ and they share in the reign of Christ. That's the recap of the millennium. And so it opens up a few other questions and let's dive into some things though. Let's talk about the nature of the reign of, of Jesus in the millennium. It will be worldwide in the millennium. Jerusalem will be the capital. Uh, it is a theocracy. It's not a uh, democracy or a republic or, um, you know, it's a theocracy being, being ruled by God, by Christ himself. It will be just. It will have a just court system. It will be spiritual, but it will be physically positive where death will be limited um, for the believer. Uh, continuing the nature of the reign, it will be a very prosperous thousand years. It will be a righteous thousand years very ethical, religiously pure, socially beneficial to animals and social conditions are all transformed and it will be peaceful for a thousand years. So why will there be a millennial reign of Christ on the earth? Um, let's answer that question. Why is there going to be a thousand year reign of Christ? A couple of answers. Number one, to fulfill prophecies of the Old Testament of a future Davidic kingdom on earth. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, this is what God told King David. He said, when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you, your descendant, and I will establish his kingdom, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so it is believed by many that this fulfillment finds its ultimate fulfillment within the millennial reign of Jesus. Jesus is a descendant of David. And so we see that in Matthew 1, when you study in Matthew chapter 1. 
Why will there be a millennial reign of Christ on earth? A couple of more reasons. Number two, to fulfill the covenant promises of the Old Testament. When you read about the new covenant, they find their fullest fulfillment in the millennial age, which is coming. Number three, to fulfill the words and promises of Jesus. Number four, to demonstrate that even in a near perfect environment with no satanic temptation, man is capable of rebellion against God. And so we do see a rebellion that comes. At the beginning of millennium, two types of persons are on the earth. This is one moment that, that confuses me and, and many believers. This is one that, that people have very differing views on. But most agree on this, that there will be at the time of the millennium, number one, believers with glorified bodies. And number two, believers with non-glorified bodies. These are the ones that kind of survived the tribulation, made their way into the millennium. And we don't see any clear clarity there where they are given glorified bodies. Those that are that are raised um, are, are given the ability there to, uh, to have a glorified resurrection body. But those that survive the tribulation and make their way into the millennium as believers, it's believed they will have non-glorified bodies. So this is where it gets all over the map, depending on who you read. If you follow that view, that would mean that the non-glorified believers can and will have children. And that these children, like all persons, will have the opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus. Outwardly, it appears all will say yes. Inwardly, however, in their heart, many will say no. So why, why is there this whole thing? We know at the end of the millennium, Satan is loosed, and he deceives the nations after a thousand years. He deceives many from the nations. He causes them to have a war, a final war at the end of the millennium, the millennium with the holy city, Jerusalem, and the saints. And so the question is, where do these people come from, and how do they get to that? And, and this is the best theory for how you get to that condition, because why would why would Satan be released and then people who are already solid believers in Jesus fall away from their belief in Jesus and want to overtake his kingdom? It doesn't make sense. So this is the best explanation in the short verses we have of how a rebellion can happen at the end of the millennium. When the opportunity comes to rebel against the most wonderful leader the world has ever known, these descendants here will jump at the chance. Their doom is sealed even before the rebellion begins. And so it raises so many interesting questions. Will those kids, um, will they die? Uh, you know, will there be generations that will follow? Will, I mean, it just, it, there are a lot of mysteries here that aren't really spelled out. And so it leads to a lot of conjecture. It leads to a lot of diversity. And we need to be humble as we study this part of the millennium. Verse seven, it says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. So the devil will be set free after the millennium, after the thousand years. His strategy at the end is no different than it was at the beginning and throughout his diabolical career. It's to deceive. He will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth. In the four corners of the earth, the four main points of the compass from all over the planet. He's going for everybody. Gog and Magog show up here. And, and there's so many views on this. So let me try to explain Gog and Magog. But reading from verse 8, Gog and Magog together them for battle. When you read the Old Testament chapters of Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a war that's mentioned there that has not happened anywhere in history yet. No scholar believes that that war has happened. It's where all of these nations that surround Israel come at Israel and they try to destroy Israel. And so most believe, a lot of folks believe that is a, the war that will end the millennium. That's the war. So Gog and Magog. So some see this as the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which occurs at the end of the millennium. There are others in our church that see Ezekiel 38 and 39 as a battle occurring either near or during the tribulation. A lot of the people I'm following believe it will happen before the tribulation happens. It's the battle that kicks off the tribulation, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 battle. So there's a bit of diversity among godly folks on where this battle falls. So why would Revelation 20 verse 8 mention Gog and Magog? And I think when you really read um, and study Ezekiel 38 and 39 and read Revelation 20, I believe that I see a lot of similarities where I, I lean into the former view here, that I see it as the, the battle. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the battle that ends the millennium. Uh, I'm willing to, to bend on that. I'm willing to hear what, what you may think, um, but that's kind of where I'm at. Another view is that Gog and Magog are just terms that represent the enemies of God who come from all the nations. And so this is a symbolic view of Gog and Magog. 
when you find them in Ezekiel 38 and 39, they were very much blaspheming against God and his people. And so they just think it's just representative, um, symbolic use. And so those are the three major views of Gog and Magog in verse 8. But their number, when they show up to take the holy city, is like the sand of the sea. So their number is so great here, it cannot be counted. In verse 9, let's see how the battle happens here. They came up across the breadth of the earth, surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. So they surround Jerusalem, the beloved city, where King Jesus lives. Incredibly, Satan has deceived them into believing, number one, he's not worth following. Jesus is not worth following. Number two, that Jesus can and should be dethroned. So something will happen that will lead to that deception. But look at verse 9, then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And so John MacArthur says, like Armageddon a thousand years earlier, the battle will in reality be an execution. Fire comes down. Same as Genesis 19 when you have Sodom and Gomorrah in 2 Kings 2. And they are devoured. The text is quick, it's simple, and clear. And look at verse 10 here. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. So Satan finally receives his just reward, which is hell, the lake of fire. He's not there now in hell, uh, but he will be there at Revelation 20, verse 10. Uh, the verse goes on to say where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the beast and the false prophet are already there waiting on the devil uh, in this passage. Like from where we sit in history, we're still waiting for the unveiling of the beast the false prophet, the antichrist, and, and the false prophet. But when they're all thrown into hell, it says they will be tormented there day and night forever and ever. So their torment is literal. It's mental, physical, and eternal. There's no reprieve, no relief, no second chance. There's no end to it. it it's the ongoing eternal conscious torment right there in Revelation 20, verse 10. So how do we apply this? How do we apply these things? And this is where we're, we'll wind it down. Number one, uh, if we're just going to apply verses 1 through 10, number one, believers will be entrusted with significant responsibilities in the future kingdom. Those on the thrones, interpreted as all believers, will be given authority to judge and will also reign with Christ. While the details remain a mystery, I mean, what does it mean? We're not sure. The text is not opening up on that. We know for certain that believers will in some way participate with God in judging and in ruling. This leads to two points. First, if we are to be entrusted with such significant work in the future kingdom, how much more should we be faithful in what God has given us to do right now? That's a wonderful application. Um, second, those who have been judged by the world system will one day become the judges. Those who have suffered injustice will one day be in a position to administer God's true justice. But again, it's mysterious how this will all unfold. Another application from tonight's passages, number two, Christians will never experience the second death, eternal death, and they shouldn't fear it. We will never be condemned, Romans 8.1. You could say that those who are born twice, born physically and born of the Spirit, will only die once, physical death. Well, those who are born only once, physical birth, will die twice. They will have physical death and eternal death, spiritual death. Uh, you may need to slow down and really soak that in, but many of you, I think, really know what that's saying, and it's a, it's a really wonderful thing to think through. Although a compromising lifestyle may rattle our assurance of belonging to God, those who are genuine believers remain eternally secure. We are citizens of God's beloved city. We're safe and we're secure theologically. Psalm 46 provides a remarkable parallel for reflecting upon God's protection and sovereign care. So I would encourage you, if you want to be at peace tonight, read Psalm 46. Uh, number three, God's victory is certain. His judgment is just. And so how comforting it is to know that all of our enemies will one day be forever defeated. The evil one who accuses, who tempts, who tries to deceive will in the end be condemned to the fiery lake of eternal torment. I mean, this is that final note of destruction on evil right here in this passage tonight. This is this is the happy ending uh, where, where evil is vanquished. So Mangina in his commentary writes this, if the millennium is the visible sign of God's yes to his creation, then the lake of fire symbolizes his divine no, his rejection of all that would threaten his divine creation. So there will be no more enemies left to be defeated. God wins. God wins. So what an what a awesome ending here. The millennium also proves beyond a doubt that wicked, the wicked, deserve and even prefer God's punishment. They've had every chance to repent, every chance to submit to their creator and redeemer, but they've stubbornly refused. And God's justice endures. 
And so uh, we have the Old Testament connections. We have covered so many of these. Uh, these are here, though, for your study. And uh, we, we are just going to skip past that a bit tonight. Let me give you a summary and then a conclusion, and we'll wrap up. Uh, the key themes that we've looked at tonight, believers will participate in God's judgment and Christ's reign. Christians will never experience the second eternal death and should not fear it. The wicked will continue to be deceived by Satan into opposing God and his people. And after one final attempt to destroy God's people, Satan will be thrown into the fiery lake and tormented forever. So just to give a conclusion, very simply, Paige Patterson, who was the president years ago of Southeastern Seminary in 1990, he dined with Yasser Arafat in the guest home of Saddam Hussein. As they visited, Dr. Patterson asked Mr. Arafat, do you think there will ever be peace in the Middle East? And Mr. Arafat said he was unsure, but that he hoped so. Dr. Patterson responded by saying, I know so. And he read to him Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. Let's look at this in conclusion. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into to pruning hooks or running hooks, as it says. Your nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And, and said it will happen when King Jesus comes again. And that is our belief as Christians. Jesus will come. He will bring peace to the nations. Jesus has already come to bring pre, uh, peace, not peach, but peace to your heart. You can know that peace even today, if you don't know it, and right now, just say yes to Christ. I promise you, you will not be disappointed at all. That concludes our study for tonight. If anyone listening or watching this is in need of salvation, by all means, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let's open it up. Um, I will stop the live stream uh, that's heading out to the, the world, and then you can uh, open up for a few questions here as we end. So let me let me shut that down. If you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, uh, feel free to join us.